what questions they're here to I never look at the questions beforehand because that spoils my fun. Dear Ajahn Brahm, Ajahn mentioned during deep meditation the body disappears and then the mind. This can be a frightening experience, but uh, we do this every day when we go to sleep and lose consciousness during the period of sleep, yet we enjoy letting go of our consciousness during sleep and there is no fear. What is the difference between losing one's consciousness mindfully during meditation and simply going to sleep? Uh, sometimes it's the same. Sometimes you see people meditating and they're losing their consciousness. <laughs> but when it's very mindful, what happens is the, the bliss is much more powerful. And so the, that power can be a bit disconcerting because one has never experienced it before. And also, maybe it's because we're very used to sleeping. We don't have as a kid. And then uh, sometimes we're really aware, we're awake, we are mindful. When I say losing the consciousness and losing the body, these are, these are steps. And actually the consciousness, when consciousness vanishes, that's a huge step. But first of all, the body goes. And you're very, very mindful. A gentleman in Singapore once that he was meditating, and he said, just, I couldn't feel my hands. That's all that let them disappear. But because that was a strange experience to him, he thought there must be some disease he'd contracted where he won't be able to feel his hands again. And the main reason why it was frightening because he couldn't control his hands. And you know, it's only during for five minutes during meditation. And it's just like sometimes you're sitting here and you, know, you can't find where your legs are. And means that there's no problem at all, you're perfectly mindful, very awake. But then just the, the awareness of the body has just been cut off for a while. So all it really is, I'm not sure many of you may have had experiences uh, where you wake up in the morning where you can't move. And sometimes it's scary for people, it's, it's just an ordinary um, uh, neurological condition. Now, many people have it, it's not really um, dangerous or whatever. It's just you know, part of your, your mind is broken up, part of your brain is broken up, but the rest hasn't. And so people can get scared that way. They feel there's something pressing on them and they can't move, they can't do anything. So all this is really is the fear of losing control. The difference between meditation and sleep. When that starts to happen, when that starts to happen, it's just uh, in sleep, it's just you know, you're losing consciousness straight away. In meditation, the consciousness is getting hugely powerful. And then afterwards, later on in the deep meditation, we're talking about the rupa states, then the mindfulness starts to vanish. But you know, it goes out with the wall, incredible amount of happiness. Uh, of course, some of the other things which sometimes happen when you're doing lots of walking meditation. Have you ever experienced that state when you're walking backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards, and it becomes purely automatic? You're walking and you're not doing it. You're not deciding to move the next step. It's just the body is doing it by itself. Weird at first, but you notice that the body does that all the time. You know, your heart beats, you know, your lungs breathe. Most of it is just autonomous. But when something as usual as walking becomes autonomous, that becomes really interesting. What is willed and what is just automatic? So the reason it becomes scary sometimes is that you're losing control. Why are you getting a lot of this? Anyway. Next question. If attachment is something to avoid, is it a problem if I become attached to practicing meditation? Not all attachments are to be avoided. If you're travelling on a motorbike, on the back, 
in the middle of busy traffic. Please be attached. Sometimes we have words and we think that uh, they're all bad. Attachment is bad. But some attachments are very good. And especially you become attached to practicing meditation. Me, I'm attached to breathing. <laughs> if I wasn't, I'd be in trouble. So remember that it's not all attachments are bad. Our minds are constantly bombarded with thoughts. Now, uh, even that, sometimes you wonder. By trying to be mindful in the present moment, are we reducing this inner chatter so that we can observe reality, uh, true nature, and avoid being deluded? Also, do the thoughts occur because our minds are constantly fluctuating between the past and future, not in the present? Yeah, that's pretty much the case. Well, if you are in a present moment, those thoughts tend to, to disappear. Not that the thoughts, not something outside of you which is being bombarded by thoughts, just like um, uh, when you are sort of in an airport, you're bombarded by announcements. Uh, about uh, a few years ago, I went into one of these prayer rooms in the airport, thinking that it'd be a nice place I could find some peace. So I went in the prayer room, sat down, started meditating, and paging for Mrs. Smith, please come to the, the your flight is waiting for you. <laughs> so watch the breath, watch the breath. Please, if you see any suspicious behaviour, <laughs> please <report. laughs> And there was announcements every one second, so it wasn't very really peaceful at all. But when it comes with your thoughts, most of the thoughts, especially in a place like this, they just can be viewed as internal. It is just the waves on a lake. And though you are the mind, is your lake. And it's just waves on the surface. They're not bombarded. What is the cause of thoughts? And you'll often find that the times when you are silent, that when there is hardly any thoughts at all, it is because you're content. You're, you're happy. You don't need to think. Similar to the time when you, know, you can be with somebody that you've, you know, a partner, you've lived with for years and years and years. And as if you know what they need before they even say it. Because you lived together for such a long time. You don't need to talk. It's not as if some of these partners, which I've seen, it's not as if that they have got angry at one another, so I'm not going to talk to you. It's that they don't need much speech. They don't need to have any orders or any sort of comments because they're in harmony together. So a lot of thinking is a case of disharmony inside the mind. It doesn't need to do anything when it's at peace. And then there's no thought. But back to the idea of the fear. Sometimes, when I'm really peaceful, and a thought comes in, I say, where did that come from? But then, over many years, and being more mindful, I find the thoughts don't come in from nowhere. I go out and grab the thoughts to disturb myself because it takes a while to be comfortable with peace and silence. It's like you may be in the old days at home, you're bored, so you go and turn on the TV. When I was watch TV, there was only two channels, ITV and BBC. Now there's about 70 or 80 channels. And you look through them and you say there's nothing on TV. <laughs> And you look at something to eat, and you go into your freezer and refrigerator, there's nothing to eat, and the food just falls out. <laughs> so all it is is a bit of boredom. Boredom is the lack of contentment with peace and silence. You actually go to stoke yourself. I don't know in your life how many problems and troubles you have. 
But you know, there's always some problems and troubles in monasteries or committees or something, but sometimes you have a very, very peaceful time. You know what many people do in this country? They're nice and peaceful, but then they turn on the TV to disturb themselves. They go and watch a, a Korean drama or Coronation Street. Is Coronation Street still on? What did you do that for? <laughs> Just to disturb yourself. <laughs> People are attached to worry. What is something to think about? So that's one of the reasons why we have thoughts. Because we're afraid of silence. In silence as if we don't exist. But when there's things to do, then it's important. And Chamba, what would the Satipatthana practice look like if we really follow the instructions given in the Satipatthana Sutta? What it would look like is, first of all, abandoning the five hindrances. First of all, you just uh, you restrain them. And when you restrain those five hindrances, because Kamachanda and uh, Vaipada want him, you don't want anything. In the morning, chanting, sometimes I wonder, should we do chanting or not do chanting? And when all chanted, and I said, no, no, this is great brainwashing, because there's some very good instructions in there. Let you be contented and easily satisfied, not proud and demanding in nature. In other words, not wanting anything. Be contented. It's good enough. Not demanding. I have to make progress. I have to get to the next stage. This is good enough for me. That type of attitude is what happens when you overcome hindrances. You don't want anything. You're not sort of upset. Because you don't want anything, so you can't be disappointed. And because of that, you don't do much work. You're not restless. You're just happy to be here. And because you're not restless, not wasting energy, your tiredness disappears. You're clear, energized, and happy. You have power. So what you see, what you hear, is very clear. This is in my little book, this is what I call Superpower Mindfulness. There are many examples of that. I won't tell the gross one which I told the other night about going to the toilet. This was when I was, every year during our retreat period, I gave myself two weeks vacation. My vacation is spent in my cave, and it's real vacation, you empty your mind. <laughs> and after a nice two-week retreat, the first meal after my retreat was a breakfast, and uh, it was some baked beans. And the first baked bean which I put in my mouth, it was an explosion of bliss. I've never ever tasted a baked bean like that in my life. It was just the texture of it. I mean, it, the bean is not hard, not soft, it like crumbles you know, in your mouth. And you need to chew it, just you know, squash it. <laughs> and the tomato taste, I mean, the tomato sauce is, you know, just it's sweet and sour, just like a tomato, and just filled my whole mouth. It was what they call like a taste explosion, it was a sensation. And it was just, just a single baked bean, that's all it took. Wow. <laughs> and it was because the mind was so clear and I could just enjoy the taste of a baked bean to the max. You were so aware you could take all of the taste and the texture nothing was missed and you just could not go quickly onto the next big bean. Just one bean was just more than enough for my senses to 
go, wow. It's incredible. That's called power mindfulness. Not just ordinary mindfulness, you can see, but you can't see deeply, you can't see the full picture. You're not really awake. But where do you get these powerful mindfulnesses? And that's what the Satipatthana is like. You can see everything. It's through not fully understanding the nature of reality. That is the reason why people don't get mind. Because you're not awake enough. So this is what the meditation does. You really get awake and I was like, wow. It's amazing, things you don't expect. I never expected a baked bean to say ten sandwiches. It's not the baked bean, of course. It's my mind is so powerful, whatever you look at. It's amazing. <coughs> you have said that striving and working hard is pointless. Not really pointless, but it doesn't achieve stillness in meditation. Well, not everyone is a monastic. I think I agree with you. <laughs> Didn't the Buddha give guidance to lay people in the Mahamangala Sutra and Sikharavada Sutra where people advise to carry out their duties and be successful in my life? Of course. And so if we didn't have successful people, you know, just like the, uh, the great cooks and organisers of this retreat centre and all the other people who are supporting us, we would be able to do this. So it's important to be they're successful if you want to lay life up to a point, but what is success anyway? But there's a time when we stop, when we let go and relax. And in life, we all know how to work hard. But how many of you know how to stop and take a break and relax and deeply relax? There was one of my favourite stories was of a monk called Ajahn Buddha Dasa in the south of Thailand. He's passed away a long time ago. But when he was building his meditation hall, he had it half built when the rains retreat started, the time of monastic retreat. So he sent all of the builders home. In a couple of days' time, a visitor came to his monastery, saw the half-built hall, and just casually asked Ajahn Buddha Dasa, when is your hall going to be finished? To which the monk replied, it is finished. And the gentleman, the visitor, said, what are you talking about? Are you going to leave it like this? There's no roof on the building, there's no glass in the windows, there's cement bags and odd pieces of wood all over the place. Is this some sort of statement or some artistic... Uh... <laughs> he said, what do you mean it's finished? And then this great teacher said something which I've always kept in mind. He said, what's done is finished. And then he went off to meditate. Isn't that wonderful? What's done is finished. See, otherwise your work, your jobs, your career will never be finished. So we understand that what's done is finished. Means that whether you're a monastic, and we have to work hard as well, or whether you're a lay person, you have to work hard too. Remember there's a time when you let go, relax. And you don't even think about your work when you go home. You don't think about it at night time when you're sleeping. What's done is finished. And you carry on next day, if you want to. However, some people, like whatever you say, whatever teachings, there are always some people who misinterpret that. And there was, when I first mentioned that story, on one of my Friday night talks in Perth. On Sunday, uh, some Sri Lankan parents came up to me to complain. Said, Jan Bobby should not mention that story again. I said, why? Well, they said, on Saturday evening, 
our 17-year-old son went out to a party. And we asked him, because the agreement was he could not go to the party until he finished his homework. <laughs> and the father said to his son, Son, have you done your homework yet? Have you finished it? And he said, just like Ajahn Brahm taught us on Friday night, Dad, what's done is finished, see you on Sunday. <laughs> It's a great thing, isn't it? When you see your boss at work and say, have you finished that, um, that uh, report yet? So, what's done is finished. <laughs> but you can understand in life you do need to take breaks, otherwise your work will never be finished. So, what's done is finished. And that is how you can put your striving in, but when you get to your cushion, to rest, meditate, to become enlightened and striving. Just like that. And then see what happens. If Buddhism were a computer game, how it would be called Escape from Planet Earth. Disgust. <laughs> You're talking to the wrong monk. There were no computer games when I was a kid. So Although I do know <laughs> Escape from Planet Earth, or maybe this is an opportunity for mentioning the word computer game about the explanation of what enlightenment is. Because I do recall when I was at school, it was, I was a you know, poor kid, but got scholarships and went to a quite a good school. It was, it was in Hammersmith, Latin school. And when I went there, there, there was a chaplain. And it was an Anglican school. And I was just respectful. And I was also uh, interested. So I remember made an appointment with the chaplain. I still remember his name. Reverend Evans. Reverend Evans. And anyway, you know, he was, so I asked him, sort of, what is God? And I just can't get my head around exactly what it really means. And I was being respectful. And he said, well, it was the, the beginning and end of all things. The ineffable. Yeah. The, the, the A to Z of everything. And the ground of all being. And it's beyond words. And I said, but yeah, what does it mean? Because all of those words were like property good for me. The ground of all being. I know ground, I know being, but what's the ground of all being? Ineffable, what does that mean? I mentioned it already. And just the, the A to Z, is it like in those old days? Remember those A to Z street directories? The Alpha and Omega? So nothing made sense to me. And then later on, when I became a Buddhist, I asked some senior monks, well, what is enlightenment, what's Nibbana? They said, the ground of all being. <laughs> the beginning and end of all things. The ineffable. <laughs> Unfortunately, I came to the same conclusion. The guy doesn't know what he's talking about. Can you give me something a bit more tangible? Because I also notice sometimes, and please, you know, if you come away from this talk or any talk with this uh, idea, you know, please just reject it. Because sometimes I went to these Buddhist talks as a lay person, and afterwards, we come out afterwards and we talk about it, and we say, wow, that was really deep. That was so profound. Because we didn't understand a word of it. <laughs> I equated sort of, you know, gobbledygook with sort of profundity. And if I did understand it, that could not be deep. Of course, that's not true. When I was uh, studying theoretical physics, there was a wonderful quote from Werner Heisenberg, one of the founders of quantum theory. And Werner Heisenberg once said, if you 
understand quantum theory, if you really know it, you will be able to explain it to the barmaid at your local pub and she will be able to understand it. Your ability to explain is, uh, is because you understand it thoroughly. So if you understand what I'm saying, it doesn't mean that it's, it's uh, not deep stuff. It means that you know, it's uh, being well known and well, under well understood and well explainable. So, because of that, that I came across a wonderful description of what enlightenment is, which anybody can understand. And it was the, the story of the five children playing the wishing game. And the rules of the wishing game are, everyone has a wish, and the person who comes up with the best wish wins the game. So the first kid asked, what would you wish? And they said, a computer game. A new one, a new Nintendo, I don't know what I'm talking about, computer games. So, what's a, a popular computer game? Fortnite. Fortnite, okay. A new copy of Fortnite, whatever that is. And, very good. So the next kid had longer to think. If ever you ask a question or in some sort of debate, never be the first to answer. Because there was another story going off on a tangent of these uh, three religious leaders, the Buddhist, what is it called, a Buddhist nun. Well, they always have been Buddhist nuns. The Buddhist nun, the rabbi and the bishop. And the Buddhist nun, the rabbi and the bishop wanted to somehow just to go a bit further in interfaith dialogue and understanding. They started to have lunch together and they got some friendship but they wanted to go a bit deeper. So they decided to have some games afterwards. They decided to play poker. <laughs> and you know, instead of just playing for match games, they played for real money. That will, that will sort of understand one another. So there they were, playing poker for money, and in that uh, jurisdiction it was illegal, so they got arrested. And they had to appear in court. And the judge asked the first of them, the, the, the rabbi, he said, look, I won't waste time with you. You know, you're a man of the cloth, a woman of the cloth. You are religious, honest, Rabbi, were you gambling? And the rabbi did a trick, which I used to do at school. He crossed his fingers behind his back and said, No, I was gambling. Do you remember that old trick? They still do that, crossing their fingers. Anyway, he crossed his fingers behind his back. I don't know what that means anyway, but he can give me. So anyway, he said, No, okay, you're free. I trust you. And then it was a bishop. Bishop, were you gambling? And faster than the eye could catch, he looked up to the sky, forgive me God, and said, no. Okay, you're free. And then they, the nun, and the Buddhist nun, were you gambling? And I know you don't believe in God, because you, know, you don't need to sort of look up to the sky. And you know, don't put your fingers behind your back. Tell the truth. Where are you gambling? And the man replied, With who? Always with the last. <coughs> so anyway, the second kid, if you had a wish, what would it be? I had a bit of time to, to think it. No, she said, oh, I would like a computer game shop. Because if it's my own shop, I can get the next computer game whenever I want it. I own a shop, it's not just one computer game, I get heaps. Beat that. And the next kid said, well, the trouble with playing computer games, you now for a kid, is your mum and dad say you've got to finish your homework first. 
and they've listened to Arthur Grant's stories, so they can't get away with what's done is finished that. So what I would like, as my wish, would be one hundred billion dollars. <laughs> US. Because with one hundred billion dollars US, I could buy my own computer game shop. And the next thing I'd buy is my own school. If I own the school and pay the teachers, if they give me bad marks, I'll sack them. And once I graduate from my own school, I will next buy my own university, which apparently is what Mr. Trump did, wasn't he? He bought his own university. <laughs> and I can, <laughs> I can give myself whatever degree I want. And I can buy my own monastery, give myself a uh, Java's and um, Enlightenment degrees instead of <laughs> with with a hundred billion dollars US, no way can I ever spend that in one lifetime. You know, I'm not a government; they can spend that so quickly. <laughs> so anyway, so that's my wish: a hundred billion dollars US. Beat that. I'm just saying 200 billion or 300 billion is just the same, it's just more money than you can ever spend in a lifetime. So the fourth child said, if I had a wish, she was really clever. If I had a wish, I would wish for three wishes. That's a wish. Now for my first wish, I will have the computer game shop. My second wish, I will have 100 billion dollars US. And for my third wish, I will have three more wishes. <laughs> <laughs> really smart, that way I can go on forever. Be that, an infinity of wishes granted. And the last child, really, really, really smart. He was from India, bald head, many years ago. He said, if I had a wish, I wish I was so content I never needed any more wishes. The Buddha. You don't need any more wishes. You're content. The end of wanting. That's enlightenment. The wish before, every wish granted, that's power. That's why People with more than enough money, people like a Mr. Trump, enter politics. Some of them wonder, why do you do that? Why do you want to enter politics when you've got so much money? You can just do whatever you want. Because power, having your wishes granted. So, wealth is not enough. You want power. Power is not enough. In the end, you let go. No wishes left. So content, you never need a wish ever again. So that's how you escape, not just from planet Earth, but from the solar system, from the universe, from the whole of Samsara. <coughs> I'm not really answering your question because I don't know anything about computer games. <laughs> Latest scientific research into positive psychology shows a positive world having goals plays in being happy. Can you please explain your opinion of having goals in life? All goals will end up being frustrated. It keeps you happy for a while. It's like feeding you what you want to keep you running around the maze like a mice chasing the bit of cheese. If it has goals placed in being happy, when I don't have any goals, am I happy? <laughs> Your goals are sometimes frustrated. You may have a goal, but where does it lead? I think I mentioned this story before that one, one person who was following that advice and she told me that in her life this was her goal 
And this is where she, she was right now. This is where she knew she had to be to achieve her goals in life. And it was just so frustrating. She could sometimes get up a bit close, but then she'd fall away again. And she asked me, just how can I just achieve my goals in life? This is why I am, this is where my goal is. So easy. Lower your expectations. Reduce your goals. And when your goals is right where you happen to be now, then you're content. Mm -hmm. Problem solved. Sometimes I like going against common perceptions. Instead of raising your expectations, how about lowering them? I have no expectations of you lot. I lowered them a long time ago when I first. <laughs> That's why you can be happy. I certainly lowered my expectations of myself. And Venerable Chandler. <laughs> That's why I'm so happy, don't expect anything. And then every wonderful thing which happens is a joy, it's a wonderful surprise. We do live in a goal-driven society, but my goodness, are you really happy? Or was it somebody was telling me that what real happiness is, is not having goals. Because goals just make you stressed out. Or was it, it was, I think, from uh, the great English philosopher, one of my favourite English philosophers, I don't know if you've done philosophy at university or dabbled in philosophy, but many of you know this philosopher, uh, Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> <laughs> Who said, now what was it now is nothing. Is, you know, what do you mean? He said his favourite job is doing nothing. And what is doing nothing? Define it. And he said, Doing nothing is what you're doing when somebody asks you, what are you up to? <laughs> and you say, doing nothing. <laughs> and then you go off and do it. <laughs> In other words, why do you have to have goal-driven activity? Why is it that everything which you put your mind to is for, for, for doing something? achieving something. When you give a donation, why is it for something? When you smile at somebody, why? When the chicken crosses the road, why does it have its intentions questioned every time? <laughs> why can it just cross the road for no reason whatsoever? <laughs> So sometimes a golden society is wonderful. Do things for no reason at all. So it's challenging. So I think we're used to having the reason why in psychology people say people have goals and more happy, because they just don't know how to do nothing these days. And they get confused and they get bored. And so that's why they get frustrated. We haven't learned. What was that wonderful Buddhist joke? There are Buddhist jokes now about the person who rang up the the uh, the nuns monastery in Oxford. We got a sort of uh, Mihari coming up in Oxford, uh, and so they they rang up and the the nun answered and said, "We, Venerable Chanda, we need you to come." to our house today to do a blessing. And the Venerable Nun said, I'm sorry, I'm busy today. And the caller asked, what are you doing? And she replied, nothing. This is my nothing day. And at least they were wise enough to understand, oh, wonderful. So many people, they call themselves religious and leaders and running around with ch by chickens with their heads off, running this way, running that way, doing so many things. Isn't it wonderful to see someone who is 
actually not walking the talk, but sitting in seat. We're <laughs> <laughs> just peaceful. Wonderful. And so they were very, uh, very happy because now there's a real man who just sits there and doesn't do stuff. Just like a Buddha. Just like the Buddha behind me, just sitting there, so inspiring. So, the next day he called again. Of course, Venerable Chanda picked up the phone. Yes. Oh, great, I got through to you. Look, I, I really need you to come and do a blessing today. And she said, I'm sorry, I'm busy. What are you doing today? Same as yesterday, nothing. Well, that was your excuse yesterday. Precisely, I haven't finished yet. <laughs> So get that on top of your to-do list. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> the problem is though that I, I've noticed that people just don't know how to do nothing. You have a day off, maybe a public holiday, you're sitting at home. And have all these things you want to do. A whole list of stuff. And I tell people, well just, just go and sit in your garden if you've got a garden and enjoy it. Can they? They go in there, they sit in their garden to see the beautiful little butterflies flitting through the trees and the birds pooing on the lawn and, <laughs> and they say to themselves, they start thinking. So now that, now that lawn really needs mowing and those leaves, they need, need raking. And now that flabbered over there, it looks a bit dry too. and a little hydrangea would be good. That is not relaxing, that is doing stuff in your head planning, you still get tired. So in order to learn how to do nothing, which is part of meditation technique, you sit on a chair in your garden and say, even though the lawn needs mowing, even though the leaves need raking, even though the bushes need pruning, not now. Now is the time I enjoy the garden as it is. Not waiting to improve it, but to enjoy it. Later on I might wash it, <coughs> but not now. This is my garden, it's not my office, it's not my workplace. It's my best place. Otherwise it's a waste of time having a garden. So it's another place you work. Anyway, next question. A Buddhist teacher likens the ego to an addiction. It is hard to fight as it gives us so much comfort and security. Apart from meditation, trying to stay in the present moment, do you have any tips or strategies to help overcome this addiction, please? Joy and inspiration and even ecstasy. There's a saying which I'm surprised I haven't said this yet. It's from Rusudi Maga. The path is, but no traveller on it is seen. Enlightenment is, but no person who enters it. The whole path of meditation is learning how to let the ego vanish and disappear. An addiction is more like a safety blanket. You feel secure in what you have known and experienced so far. And to go somewhere different, again, is scary. But as you develop the meditation, deeper and deeper you get more and more peaceful, more and more happy, more and more joy. And it gets incredibly strong. And it comes to a point where to take the next step into the deep meditations, you have to disappear. You have to let go, and that's one of the most scary of things. Letting go of addiction to identity vanish. There's so much bliss. They can see it over there, just but I can't go, I don't know what it's going to be like, it looks so much fun. But then I have to just you know, disappear, but oh, it's so wonderful. 
And but then, you know, I thought, what the hell I'm going for it. <laughs> it is actually the joy, the bliss, which drags you in against your fear. Too much joy. And if it wasn't that enormous bliss of a deep meditation, I don't think people would do it. The joy overcomes the fear and the addictions. And I like to actually express you know, this is a really happy path, a wonderful path, a great joy. Why does the mind move? Or what makes the mind move? Wanting. That makes it move. Wanting anything, even good stuff, kind stuff, makes the mind move. Okay, Ajahn Charles Simone. He would he didn't have many visual aids, but he would always be waving his hand up and down like this and say this was a leaf on a tree or a leaf on a bush. It only moves because of the wind. If the wind stopped, the leaf would move less and less until it came to be absolutely still. It only moves because something outside of it makes it move, the wind. The natural state of a leaf, what we would call these days the default state, is to be still. So that's the same as the human mind, said Ajahn Chah. It only moves because of the wind of wanting something. If you protected your mind from wanting, it would move less and less until it become perfectly still. Getting the jhanas and all incredible stuff. It's only because of wanting that you can't be still. So, it's a powerful teaching from Ajahn Chah, and it's also, if ever you are, get a blockage in your meditation, and you say, why isn't it developing, why isn't it going in? It's because you want something. So sometimes using insight in your path of meditation. If ever that happens in my meditation, uh, why isn't it still developing? Don't even ask that question. So, what do I want? I'm wanting something. When I catch what I'm wanting, it vanishes. And then you go deeper into meditation. Wanting is the enemy. Second noble truth. <coughs> wanting leads to suffering. I'd like to hear more about the beautiful breath. Mine feels jagged and irregular when I focus on it. How do I perceive, make my breath feel beautiful? I'm aware of the ridiculousness of asking if there's anything I can do. So it must be all, be all, be all about perception then. First of all, if you watch your breath now, it's not natural. Because whatever we decide to watch, we interfere with. Another example, maybe clearer for you. Now can you observe, perceive, the saliva in your throat. Now it becomes a problem. Before I asked you to perceive your saliva, it was not a problem at all. Now, you know, stop being aware of your saliva, please. <laughs> <laughs> this is what happens when we focus on the breath. We interfere with it. How about this in the meditation instructions, which I'm giving actually sequentially. But when you practice establishing mindfulness first, just relaxing, just being here, doing nothing, when your body starts to vanish, the breath just appears because it's one of the last things which is actually moving. And when you wait for the breath to come to you, rather than seeking it out, it's always just natural, peaceful, and very easy to watch. 
If you go looking for it, you disturb it. If you wait for it to come to you, it's always peaceful. So that's the first thing. Number two is when you do experience your breath, don't try and control it. Never regard your breath as a slave to follow your every command. Okay, the book says breathe in long. Okay, breath long. <laughs> short, long. It's not short enough. Come on, shorter. That is controlling the breath and that disturbs it. Regard the breath as a friend, a very close friend. Get a good relationship with your breath. I've been meditating like this for such a long time. It is like my breath sees me. Hey, I don't know. Hey, let's hang out together. Okay. <coughs> and so there's no force at all. We just chill together. Sometimes hours go by. We're just good friends, good mates. Which means we hang out together. Not a slave. With that attitude of friendship, the breath and me have stayed together for a long time. We enjoy each other's company. I don't exploit my breath for some deeper purpose. We're just friends, that's all. And then, of course, because we enjoy each other's company, there's happiness there. Oh, joy. You don't have to force anything. Oh, was, what was it? One of my old college friends, his name was, okay, his name was uh, Harry, Harold. And I hadn't seen him for about 30 or 40 years. So, you know, found out where he was, emailed him, and we met up at Victoria uh, Coach Station a few years ago. And he was, you know, a actuary, which is, you know, an accountant, incredibly successful. And I, you know, lots of money. I was a penniless monk, a loser. <laughs> so anyway, we met up and we started talking. And we couldn't stop for about four hours. It was like you were with a friend you hadn't seen twice, like you were just with him yesterday. Because our relationship was always very, very close, very kind. And, you know, we had lunch, it was actually lunch in the Sri Lankan temple, and I, I just, I had to apologise afterwards. I, they fed me, but I gave them absolutely zero attention. No chanting, no blessing, because I was talking to my mate. And then he came with me to Wimbledon temple, we were chatting all the time. The monk was uh, so welcoming me, and I was chatting to my mate all the time, and it was just, it was good friends. Not forced at all. I never chatted so long to a person. And I was wondering why. It was because we were really close friends. <coughs> That's like this with my breath. Just close friends. We hang out together and we forget everything else. If you have that attitude towards your breathing, it's easy to be with your breath. No force. See the breath. Hey, hey, guy. Yeah. Oh, let's say I've been talking to all these these retreatants for a long time. Yeah. Want to hang out? Yeah. Go on. I think I had my first jhana. A very bright light, like the sun, and felt like I was floating. I was a bit scared. Is this normal? It's always a little bit scared because number one, we're powerful. It's actually limiters. I don't think it was a full jhana, but we can actually see about that later on. Really powerful, and some of the most powerful things you've ever seen before. And so, experienced before. So it is scary because of the power of it. Very blissful, and sometimes we're afraid of happiness. Weird as it may seem. And sometimes it's the, what's going to happen next fear. So there's going into uncharted territory, really powerful. And when people experience these things, if they were Christian, they would call it union with God. 
powerful, you disappear, curve all bliss, all love, whichever way you want to look at it. And people say they're afraid. And it's, they had to disappear. But it's uh, the bliss, the love, give you that sense of safety. Nothing to fear. So when sometimes in Christianity they think you should fear God. To me as a kid I thought that's weird. How can you just fear you know, something that's supposed to be so loving? And it's just because the nature of something so powerful. That's what you experience in deep meditation. Powerful is the bliss is just too much, so you just go for it. But fear, even in the sutras, the Buddha said, that happens. When you're about to disappear. No, oh, I'm not ready for this. And even the bliss, uh, like I said in another talk, sometimes it was weird for me when sometimes so much bliss you thought you can't take any more happiness. It's too much. I think I explode with ecstasy. But one thing I discovered, and other people in control this, you can always take a bit more bliss. There's no limit. Ooh, it's nice. Why do I get very hot when I meditate? Probably because you're wearing too many jumpers. <laughs> <laughs> no, it depends in the room. But no, what really it means is that when you have been driving the car, when you park the car, the engine is turned off, but the heat is still in that engine. It takes a while to dissipate. So a lot of times, so when you are meditating, if the heat comes at the very beginning when you're sitting down, it's just your metabolism just winding down. It's used to doing a lot of stuff, so it needs you know, a lot of fuel, it's burning the oxygen, and to see whatever else it has to burn. And now you've stopped. And of course there will be a, a delay when your body is still quite hot. And then sort of it will cool down as you become more peaceful. However, there's another cause for hot spots in the body, and that is a real wonderful part of meditation. Let's see the healing energies. What's happening is sometimes if the heat goes to a certain part of your body. First time that you know, I came across this, there was a meditator who complained that every time she meditated on my retreat many years ago, her whole shoulders and neck were really hot. You know, like a fever, but localised, just in her head and shoulders. And so afterwards, well, this is really weird. How do you feel afterwards? She said, oh, really good. After that happens. And I figured it out and said, when did you have your car accident? She went quiet. At last, I know it. <coughs> Confirmation, Ajahn Brahm has got psychic powers. I never told you that. How did you know I had my car accident? And I said, no, it's not psychic powers, it's just logic. Because the most common injury from a car accident is whiplash. And that injury hadn't totally healed. And you had these hot spots in your shoulders and neck. When you get out of the way, when you disappear, when you let go, you allow the energies in your body to go to where they're needed. For you, that was a whiplash injury. You get a huge, huge amount of healing there. And of course, people have had those hot spots in other parts of the body. When that happens, please, even like rejoice. Just let it be. Don't interfere with it. It is the body healing itself. Just a few weeks ago, wonderful little things which you can do with meditation and healing. There's this um, young Sri Lankan girl in Perth. 
She was something maybe 10 years of age, I forget exactly how old now, but around roughly 10. And the doctors had discovered that she had a twisted spine. And it would only get worse with age. It was a genetic defect. And so that they wanted to put her in this, this brace for about three or four years. And you know, to make sure to get her spine to straighten up. And, you know, her mother showed me you know, a copy of the x-ray on the, the iPhone. See the, the, the spine, the spine all twisted. It was a lovely little girl and just full of life and energy, very positive. And mum said, can you help? Because this, you now wearing something which was weird would make her stand out at school and she would be bullied. That's what happens in school, even with the best intentions. You know, we'll probably call her I'm girl or whatever, I'm not sure. But it was also, it would affect her self-confidence. It would be very uncomfortable to and so he said, can you teach us some meditation? I said, okay, sure. And so he taught us some basic meditation. And especially, you know, to, it's the nice thing about kids, they've got a, such a malleable mind, a lot of faith, a lot of belief, so that they do follow instructions. And so see if you can imagine sort of a beautiful light, you know, a shortcut to limiters. And imagine a beautiful light, a very peaceful, beautiful light, and then send that light to your spine and just give it lots of healing. And she did that. And she told me that she imagined and closed her eyes, it was really peaceful and still, and got this beautiful blue light. A blue light is a very common form of limited. But I asked her, I said, what type of blue? Not a blue you can see in this world. A deeper blue, an unworldly blue. That's common with limiters, as I'll mention later on. They're more blue than blue. A very deep blue, very beautiful. And then she imagined her spine. She'd seen so many x-rays of her spine and the defects of faults in it. She imagined her spine in the middle of this light. And then she straightened the spine. Just decided to stay there. And then when she went to the next um, x-ray or whatever it was, the doctor sort of took the x-ray and came out just amazed. The lower part had straightened. So the higher part needed some work. The lower part had straightened. And she showed me the showed me the x-ray. Her mother was almost in tears. But the girl which is a big smile on her face. That was only a few weeks ago. Hopefully she's done the top part now. It's amazing what can be done. You saw it, but the, the x-ray was there. So this is using the meditation for healing, which is a wonderful thing to be able to do. And of course, imagine how I feel when you see that happen. You've done something. Yes. <laughs> I can't help feeling really joyful about that. Especially those you know, little girls. Sometimes these things can, small thing, uh, this defect can ruin so much of your life. And this gets past that. So heat in the body can also mean some healing. Don't interfere, let it go. Or let it be rather, and just see what happens. You always feel good afterwards. Thank you for the wonderful event. You ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> so I said, thank you, and then we just started. What strategies are best for overcoming hindrances of worry and anxiety? Is be kind to the future. Give the future compassion. You know what it's like when you see a dog who's you know, just really angry at you, and you give a loving kindness. Change your demeanour, your facial expression, even just you know, sometimes because you're developing kindness, the dog can feel that. Even snakes as well. Oh, did you see the uh, dude Yeah. He was this really big dude guy over in Jhanakar, our meditation retreat centre. 
And yeah, it's very dangerous. You know, there's more, the, the snakes in Australia are more venomous than anywhere else in the world. And this dude guy is getting bigger, and it's a wonderful, beautiful little animal. And you just see it there, just slithering around. It's a member of the community. They're just leaving alone. And just actually just admire it. Wonderful. And anyway, this little dude guy, I never, never buy him. Sorry? Yes, yeah, quite big, yeah. 1.6 meters, yeah. Totally lethal. But it's so French. <laughs> It'll never harm me if you're kind to it like that. So, if you're kind, then things look after you. They're not a threat anymore. So I thought, why can't we be kind and give love and kindness to our future? Then we don't have anxiety. May my future be happy and well. May my future be free from suffering. May my future be my friend. And when you give love and kindness, positive energy to your future, you do create your future, which means that your future turns out to be beautiful. If we say, Ooh, What's going to happen to the rest of the days on this retreat? Ooh, I don't think I can stand any longer. Ooh, what's the food going to be like tomorrow? I can't do this any longer. That is giving ill will towards your future. When you give kindness towards your future, may my baked beans tomorrow. <laughs> That's what I say, may all beans be happy and well. <laughs> Then you find that you, how many times when you worry that something's going to go wrong, it does go wrong. When you think it's going to go right, it goes right. Not always, but most of the time. So give loving kindness to your future. And a lot of anxiety vanishes. Same thing with the past. Give loving kindness to your past as well. It's much easier to let go. Your traumas, times you were just abused. That's important, that's part of who you are. You give kindness, you smile gently on the people who abuse you. Tough thing to do. When you give loving kindness to enemies, enemies become your friends. I think I'm deep in that, it's really interesting part of psychology, giving loving kindness to the past. As my practice continues, I am finding myself less stressed and happiness. <laughs> less stress and happiness, sorry. However, I'm not going to go to the however, I'm going to be with you. <laughs> Quit while you're ahead. Have you ever noticed that in life, you know, you just being positive and you say, but. <laughs> and you just give the ill will towards what's going to happen next. Okay, I'd better be responsible. Yeah. However, my colleagues are still stressed out and anxious and they seem uncomfortable that I am not. Do you have advice on how to handle this with better and thanks? No, it's actually good for them that you are not stressed out. There's uh, the old simile of the elephant that lost its happiness. That was actually the title of the Good Bad Who Knows book, which was in translated uh, into Deutsch into Germany. Into German. And it really was a bestseller, literally. And anyway, this uh, story was an elephant, a good elephant, very well behaved, became bad. It became uncontrollable. And it was a king's elephant, so the king got the doctors to check it out, maybe it got a virus, it was sick or something, it was irritating, they couldn't find any reason why a good, kind elephant suddenly became uh, just really uh, uncontrollable. So, one of the wise ministers, you know, Buddha-to-be, sort of went behind the, the uh, elephant stall just to check out, to gather some information. He was setting meditation there in the evening, late at night. He heard some sounds which wasn't coming from the elephant. 
and found just behind the elephant store there was a meeting place for these drug addicts, bandits, people who had to steal, beat people up, just you know, to supply their habit. And he realised why the elephant had lost his happiness and good behaviour. Because it was associating with bad people. Even though the elephant did not know the language, still picked up on the vibes. So the the uh, minister told the king, the king had the the, uh, the bad people arrested and asked the monks and nuns to go there every evening to meditate, to discuss Dharma, to do chanting. In a few days, the elephant regained its good, good habits. It is true, just you associate with good people and they're good to you. There was one gentleman who, who, who was getting into heroin addiction and his father, so wonderfully wisely, sent him away from his Asian home to Bodhinara Monastery to learn a bit of meditation but just hang out with the monks for a couple of weeks. And he credits that with overcoming his addiction. Now he's married with a second kid now and his business thrived. He's a millionaire and he was one of them who gave, I think it was 100,000 to Anacumbra and gratitude. I won't say who he is. Don't oh, ask. <laughs> and he was just associated with good people. So that's what happens. If you are a good, peaceful person, you don't need to tell them how to meditate. Don't be an evangelical Buddhist. <laughs> but just be you, kind, peaceful, and you do have an effect much greater than you imagine. I love the idea of putting down the bags of past and future to fully experience now. But how does this align with concepts of past life and karma? How do you square the circle of an explicit focus on now with a past life, reading what you sow philosophy? It is because you must have done something really good in the past that you can let go of the, ba the bags in the present. That you've come to this wonderful retreat that's a result of your incredibly good karma to meet. Actually, no, this is the truth. No, the only English bhikkhuni. <laughs> the only one. Yeah. In this country, yeah. So, here she is. So that's pretty rare. And be part of uh, creating awareness and raising funds for the first bhikkhuni monastery. Ooh. So, but there are times when we stay in the present moment. This present moment is where the future is made. So you're making your future right now. Staying in the present moment is not denying the future. It's doing the very best you possibly can for the future. And for a future life as well. You cannot square the circle of samsara. One's a square, one's a circle. Is it? Or is it just perspective? Have you ever seen that cylinder? You look at it end, end on, it's a circle. Look upon it side on, and it's a rectangle. I may be able to describe this cartoon. There were two people, and they were looking at this numeral written on the ground. One said, it's a six. The other said, no, it's a nine. No, it's a six. No, it's a nine. Can you visualize it? So number six or nine, and they're standing between it. For one person's angle, it's a six. For the other one, it's a nine. They're both right. So that's why sometimes we... Um, yeah, we, yeah, it depends on how you look upon it. 
past and future, stay with the now, we're creating a good future. Next question, please, 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 keep the guided meditation as part of the daily program. It really helps boost my practice. It reminds me, encourages me to how to practice properly. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> well, we won't do it today, but I live in the now. So who knows what's going to happen tomorrow? <laughs> Probably not. I'm trying to find some excuses. Because it did do a lot. I have to be very um, kind to my body. How long have I been in this country? It's only Thursday morning now, right? I think four days. I'm not getting old. Get back. Anyway, why are people getting born with Foa, Prego, Willy, Hilda's disabled? What's this? FOA, what did you do? No, no idea. Okay. Wiki, F-O-A, Garda, Willie, Willie. Ah, anyway, whatever we're going to say, is disabled. Why are some of these people so nasty sometimes? Are they also creating karma, disabled, with their actions? Or are they not aware of what they are doing? You know, sometimes when people are just hurting so much, that is sometimes just why they are nasty. You can't really blame them. It's just the way they are reacting. So don't take their speech or their actions as um, a criticism of the people you who work with you with them. There was a simile of the man who had the afternoon off work had a holiday. And so he was at home just messing around and his wife told him, this was in Asia some years ago, said, darling, we need some eggs for dinner. Would you mind going to the market and getting some eggs for me? Certainly, darling, anything for you. But I've never been to the market before. So she gave him a bag, a little basket, some money and a little mud map directions of where the egg store was. And so off he went to the market to get some eggs for the dinner. And as soon as he got into the marketplace, this young man, maybe 17 or 18, came right up to him and said, You, you are the ugliest person I've ever seen in my life. You have got a face like a camel. The back end of a camel, that is. And I don't know what you've been using for aftershave. But I don't, I think that smells like the back end of a dog. What are you doing? And that was only the start of the abuse and the personal criticism to this man. And the husband was very, very upset. This was done in public, in front of everybody, and he never knew this young man. He said, why are you saying I don't even know you? But that just made the abuse even worse until the husband could take no more of this unwarranted abuse and just turned around and went back home. And as soon as he came into the door, he slammed the door shut. And the wife said, you're back, really, darling. Yes, and never tell me to that stupid market ever again. People there are so abused, they're terrible. I don't want to go there ever again. I don't know how you can stand it. People are just so unkind. Blah, 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 blah. Is that good? <laughs> Not really. Maybe I should practice my anger, <laughs> make it more realistic. But anyway, as soon as uh, the wife noticed her husband had calmed down, she asked, why did that man look like? And when the husband described her, oh, it's him. That poor young man, he actually had an accident. He fell and hit his head. He's brain damaged. He can't go to school and he will never find a nice partner in life to share his life with. He'll never get a job. He just hangs out in the market most of the days. And he said many, many worse things than me. He just abuses and shouts and curses everybody. Because he's brain damaged. That's all. 
And as soon as her husband realised he'd been abused by someone who had been brain damaged, he never, all his anger disappeared. How can you be upset by being criticised or abused by someone who's going to know my So, as soon as he'd calmed down, his wife saw he'd calmed down, then she said, darling, I still need those eggs. <laughs> so he, okay, don't worry about that fellow, poor, poor boy, you know, he's been injured. And so then he took the basket, went back into the market, the young guy started cursing him again. Here comes the guy who used his dog shit for his aftershave. Here comes the ugly camel face. But this time it didn't matter. How can you be upset by someone who's crazy? And so as soon as he got the eggs, they talked about this poor boy, brain damaged, what a shame. But there was no anger or upset anymore. How can you get angry and upset about a person who says these things? Because they're crazy. And I always mention the moral of that story is, if your husband, your wife, your partner comes home one day, and they're really, really angry and upset. Don't react. Just make an assumption that they've hit their head today. <laughs> 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 that they're, they're crazy, they're brain damaged. Because that's what we usually call bad speech. Temporary insanity. So if a person does make these terrible words, this is a disease speaking, it's not that. And why these things happen? You know, who knows, we can't go back in the past, but all we do know it is happening now. It's real. So, be kind. And if you're compassionate and kind because you know they're hurting more than you, then the other thing is that they, you only meet them for so many hours every day. They're with themselves 24-7 then you have a lot of compassion for them. Do one last question and then I think the time's up. When you encouraged us to tell you what we saw when you held up the glass of water, you were something as, to use labels, words, you were urging us. How else would we have responded? How else might many of us body just silently? Just watch. But the labels have an ending. You use up all those labels after a while, because that's what language does. It gives you labels, and we always assume that the labels describe what the world is. And that's why we do philosophize. And that's why, because we philosophers, we very rarely understand what the labels are representing. And I'm finishing off this evening with one of the stories. It is the story of the philosophy professor who went to a restaurant. This philosophy professor was a gourmet so when he heard a five-star Michelin chef was visiting town, opening up a restaurant, he made a booking, and as soon as he rang out to get a booking, he realised just what a long waiting list there was, a couple of months before he could get a reservation. But he booked. In a couple of months' time, he had to dress up in a smart suit, go to the restaurant, and the maitre d' asked for his identification. Check, yes sir, you have a reservation this evening. So took the professor into the restaurant. And it was a dimly lit restaurant, but just enough to see his way to his table, his really solid mahogany table, where the waiter came and gave him the, uh, the menu. And the menu was not like you find in uh, Ramsey's Fish and Chip Shop. This was, uh, in thick card, like it was written with, on oh, with, um, uh, with, what's it called when you, the calligraphy. 
It was just beautiful writing. The menu on offer that evening by this top chef. And the professor thanked the waiter. When the waiter disappeared, the professor looked at the menu and then proceeded to eat the menu, then paid his bill and left because the professor did not know the difference between the menu and the food. So that's one of the reasons why all the words and descriptions are like the menu. They're supposed to be describing the food. So all the talks and the words which I have said today is just the menu. Please don't eat the menu. Have the food. Sadhu. 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 So have a lovely night. The other questions will be in the mix for tomorrow. Who knows? They may be answered, they may not be. Sorry? What? Yeah, I'll be here.